No my hari mai, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Eva Collins, and I'm Associate Dean of Research and Postgrad at Waikato Management School. Uh, I'm going to be your MC today, and I just have a couple of quick housekeeping things before we do our official welcome. Um, remember to turn your microphones to mute. I know we're all familiar with Zoom, but just as a, as a double check, um, and the session is going to be recorded. Um, and just to let people know, we won't be doing questions um, at the end, but Amanda, if you do have questions, Amanda is very keen to get them uh, via email, which we'll share with you. So I'd like to, now that the housekeeping things are done, hand it over to Professor John Etzel, who is going to do our opening karakia. John. Kia ora. Uh, e mihi ana ki te wahi ngaro te matapuna o nga mea katoa. Ki nga mate hua hua, oki oki rā, oki oki atu. Ki a tātou te waihotanga ta, wai iho, piki mai, ngau mai, tēnā koto, tēnā koto, tēnā koto katoa. E karaki a tīmatanga. Whakataka te ho ki te uru, whakataka te ho ki te tonga, ki a mākina kina ki uta, ki mā taratara ki tai. E hi ake ana te atakura, he tio, he huka, he hau hu. Thank you, John. Um, now I'd like to um, hand it over to Associate Professor Stuart Dillon, who is the head of school for management and marketing, and he's going to introduce our speaker for us. Stuart. Thanks, Eva. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Amanda Williamson is the recipient of the Waikato Management School Award for the Outstanding Early Career Researcher for 2021. The purpose of this award is to celebrate high achieving emerging researchers and to encourage their future scholarly contributions. Amanda received the Early Career Researcher Award because of her demonstrated excellence and real world impact of her research and the clear evidence of the research platform that she is building. In addition, Amanda has contributed to the research environment, including her co-founding of the Early Career uh, Researcher Network, international funding, her external recognition, including keynote speaker invitations, media pieces, and her invitation to serve on the editorial board of the leading entrepreneurship journal, Entrepreneurship Theory and Practice, where she also serves as the engagement director. This award also reflects her willingness to participate and contribute to the life of the school, division and university. Amanda completed her PhD in 2019 on the topic of exploring the dark side and the downside of entrepreneurship with machine learning, sentiment analysis and experience sampling methodologies. Amanda's research aims to shed light on how we can reduce suffering among entrepreneurs. I'm really excited to hear Amanda talk further about her research uh, this afternoon. Thank you, Stuart. Um, Amanda, I think without further ado, over to you. Well, welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for that incredible introduction. Um, that's it's such a privilege to be able to talk to you today. And the focus of today's talk, as you know, is on business strategy in the age of AI. I think this is a timely topic uh, to present. And the focus of this talk is for executives and managers and people who are running organizations. So I'm going to outline five different topics today. Um, they are firstly giving you a primer on what AI is when I'm talking about AI, what it can do in organizations and what the competitive environment is like. Then we move on to understand uh, what the costs are to waiting and then how to actually get started. So let's begin with the first question is of what is AI? Is it just a fad? And I love this um, newspaper clipping from the year 2000 in the Daily Mail, which poses the question of, is the internet just a passing fad? Um, and in the case of AI, I do not think it is a passing fad. Um, it's already in all parts of our life. For example, on our daily purchases, um, our spam filter that prevents highly inappropriate messages landing in your inbox, um, your 
phone when you send a message and it gives you um, auto corrections which don't let you swear that's also an example of AI working in your life uh, when you use Netflix and you get recommendations and maybe even when you use your vacuum cleaner if you have um, a rumba you're using AI it's everywhere so it's transformative role in society is so extreme that some think it will pass the impact of the internet and will be more uh, similar to the impact of electricity and the fact that it will be in everything we do and we're already starting to see evidence of that. So I define it here as um, machines that can pr uh, perform tasks that humans do and improve what they do over time which is a very broad definition, and that does incorp incorporate um, artificial intelligence's um, subcomponents, meaning machine learning and deep learning, and it also encompasses robotics and computer vision as well. So the way that AI works is that it uses data inputs, and these data inputs can be from anything, from room temperature to details about a house to photos of cats. And ideally that data is structured with labels like this photo is a cat, but that's not always necessary. What is amazing about AI is that it can process huge amounts of complex information and return insights. And uh, I'm just going to put this in the black box of AI algorithms for today's talk. So what you can get insights on is vast, but here are some examples. You can predict the next value. So let's say, you give an AI algorithm lots of information about houses, the number of rooms, the location, maybe even the weather in that area. Well, it should be able to predict what the house will sell at. You can also use AI to identify customers. So who would be the people that are likely to buy that type of house given the data you have fed it? It can detect anomalies. So let's say you've got a production line and you're looking to identify issues in the uh, production, you know, quality assurance. It can help detect that. And it can learn from um, getting negative feedback about uh, that, that information as well. It can also recognize patterns. And you may have noticed when you upload photos online, it will often say, is this a photo of you? Is this a photo of your partner? And also, when we see self-driving cars become more commonplace, um, they're getting quite good at recognizing uh, possible uh, areas for caution on the road. And a thing that I think is really interesting about AI is its ability to also produce unique combinations. In this example, um, this person doesn't exist. This is an algorithm's rendering of a human based on hundreds of thousands of data points. And if you go to this website, you find a whole bunch of photos of people that look so real, but they're not real. It's just what AI has done because it's been given a lot of information to train from. And we're living in an exciting time when it comes to AI. And that's what makes this topic so important to chat about today. The culmination of different elements makes AI possible and accessible for almost everyone. We have data abundance. Uh, for example, there are sensors everywhere. We have devices. We have online communication and digital footprints on the web. And we also have structured open data sets like Kaggle. So there is data absolutely everywhere. And we also have the computational power to process that data. There have been specialized hardware built for AI like Google's TPU. And we have cloud computing, which means that people can jump onto a platform like Amazon Web Services or Google Cloud or Azure and process the information without having to have more than a simple laptop or even a phone. And algorithms, oh, this is incredible, but we now have access to cutting edge algorithms. So these big tech companies like Google and Amazon have spent years just plugging money and resources and talent to develop AI algorithms that are amazing. And a few years ago, they just released these algorithms to the world, meaning that anyone can go along and use the algorithms that these companies have adopted or created. And that's Google's TensorFlow and Facebook's Torch, for example. So we have 
these algorithms and this community around uh, algorithms has grown so fast, both in academia and in industry, that the pace of advancement is mind boggling. And we're also seeing these tools become accessible with low code or no code alternatives for people. So they don't even need to be um, experienced with software development. So now we know what AI is, it presents a question of, okay, what can we do with it? What can we do with it as executives, as managers, as people who work in organizations? And I'm going to talk you through three ways that we can use AI. And the first one is by automating work. This means improving how we perform our work. AI, the term, tends to conjure up these thoughts of science fiction books and futuristic robots. And while there is great progress being made in this space, like manufacturing, there is still quite a way to go in some industries. For example, kiwi fruit harvesting, that's still quite a well, way, well off way. <laughs> But what it's really good at is precision and predictability and also scale. So one great use, for example, is quality control. And we see this in New Zealand. Um, Fonterra uses AI to detect improperly sealed um, powdered milk bags in its factories. And we're seeing this overseas a lot as well. For example, there is a media group, a Chinese electrical appliance manufacturer that uses AI in that manner. And automating work isn't limited to robotics. It also can help with knowledge work. A lot of the tasks that we do as knowledge workers is quite repetitive and mundane. And there are estimates that about 40% of that can be automated. For example, um, with natural language processing, this is the ability to get text, understand it and provide outputs, means that software can be developed to deal with whatever domain you're in. Deloitte um, created a piece of software that allows for documents to be scanned and understood, which saves time for legal teams and frees up employees to work on other things. Now, the second area where AI is powerful in organizations is for augmenting decision making. So I mentioned before that AI allows you to detect patterns in data and allows you to do that with huge volumes of data. This means that you can use AI in practically every function of a business. And you can ask questions and answer them that you might not have ever been able to answer before, such as what are the optimal conditions for storing our product? Um, as you think about produce in New Zealand, which is a key part of New Zealand's industries, uh, it really matters what temperature a produce is stored at to get it to a destination, perhaps China, and for it to be in its peak um, performance. So you can use all of the data available to, to you to help understand this problem, the temperature, the location, the um, transportation route, and understand what decisions you should make early on. You can also understand your customers better. Um, maybe these are uh, professional customers or even end users and help understand who's going to buy what and why. We're also seeing a huge amount of um, help that AI can provide to inventory management. So the retailer Morrisons, for example, improved stock forecasting in around 500 of its stores and it was able to reduce in-store shelf gaps by 30%. Now, the financial um, implications for that is quite large. And finally, another example of augmenting decision-making with AI is by using um, what are called digital twins, and you can answer questions like, how can we lower energy consumption in commercial buildings? So around 40% of the world's energy consumptions comes from buildings. And it's very hard to improve energy consumption because if you turn off a light somewhere, you can negatively influence your um, organization. And even um, if, you're, if we go back to the produce example, for example, you can have a huge issue um, later on if you've turned off the wrong thing and stopped your freezers from working. 
So in uh, research by Apt and Spanos um, on the bottom there, they reported that they were able to use um, digital twins, which means a simulated digital, digital environment to experiment using AI um, in, uh, in this digital world. And they could reduce commercial building energy consumption by almost half. Now, that's just one area and it can be used in a whole bunch of other areas as well. And there's such cool stuff going on in New Zealand in that space. The third and final way that AI can be used in organizations today is by engaging with employees and, and customers and in better ways. And that picture on the screen is from a New Zealand startup called Sold Machines. And you might have actually conversed with a conversational AI bot um, in your online transactions or with your bank when you had a question. And what these um, bots allow us to do is to connect organizations with customers 24 hours a day and continue improving their responses to them because you start to collect data about what customers are looking for. So these systems are just getting better and better. You also notice um, that your ability to engage customers increases with AI as well, because you can um, implement things like recommendation systems. If you've ever gone to Netflix, you might notice that your profile on Netflix looks very different to your partner's profile. I know that's certainly the case for me. And what causes that is that each time you click on something on Netflix, uh, Netflix learns things about you, about what you like, about what images are going to make you want to click on something. So not only do you have different content, but the um, image that's presented to you about that content will look different for you. And this is paying off. Um, some research indicates that Netflix uh, has 75% conversion rate from recommendations, meaning that people watch what's been um, recommended to them on their personalized product page and 75 um, out of 100 times, which is remarkable. And there are huge effects from that that go on um, in other platforms like Spotify. And it's not limited to just uh, the area of uh, you know, uh, client facing work. It can also be internally and with our employees that we're improving customer and employee engaged. Sorry, I mean to say, um, improving engagement with employees. So this here is a picture of Diane Garrison from IBM, and she has done really incredible things in the area of human resource management. She uh, identified a big problem that they were having at IBM, which was their uh, retaining staff, and decided to use the data that they had on staff to um, improve conditions for them. So she helped create an algorithm which would identify factors related to turnover. So when um, employees were not getting recognition from peers, when they weren't getting bonuses, uh, this algorithm could send uh, the manager of the uh, employee a nudge and let them know that, hey, this individual hasn't had recognition for quite a long time, and maybe this is a good time to do it. And it could also give other recommendations about the engagement that they've had with the, that employee. And amazingly, um, as of early 2019, they calculated from IBM that this piece of software has saved the company nearly 300 million US dollars, which is remarkable. And that's just by using the data that they already had. So the implications for engaging employees and customers is extreme. I think by now you should be um, sold on the fact that there are lots of uses for AI in business and its applications are so wide reaching that we could go on for days about it. But I hope that's given you a bit of a, a taste tester on those three areas where AI can be used. So this is a moment that I'm going to quickly reflect on what is the state of AI in New Zealand to know what the competitive environment is for you and your organization. And what we're seeing so far is that New Zealand businesses are a bit slow to um, engage with AI, but adoption has really increased in the past year or so. 
So 60% of firms that were surveyed in a recent analysis by Force Bar indicated that 60% of them invested in AI just in the 20 to 21 financial year. So within one year, 60% of these larger firms that were in the sample have invested in AI. And of those, already six more than 60% are seeing um, net positive benefits from their AI adoption. That's very quick. So I'm really, really impressed with that information. And it suggests that it's now, we're now coming of age in New Zealand to understand um, AI and to be using it and adopting it. And if we look at other research um, that's done uh, by Deloitte in collaboration with Amazon Web Services in Australia and New Zealand in 2001, we see that it's an even more optimistic picture with the majority of um, organizations that have adopted AI to be reporting benefits. And they are not planning on slowing down. Around 41% of these firms have indicated that they aspire to be a AI powered company with transformational or systemic use of the technology within the next four years. So it's time to really pay attention to AI. This moves us on to considering the competitive environment for AI. What's the cost of waiting? Perhaps you want to see what your competitors are doing. Let them uh, experiment and incur the costs. What's the harm of waiting, right? Well, the research indicates that there is harm. So the organizations that move first to adopt AI quickly, these are called the leaders in this um, graphic here, are more than twice, I have more than twice or double the revenue than the laggards. Those are the companies that are slow to adopt AI. That's over a three year period and with 150 companies in a range of industries in the US. And the reason that this happens is driven by two forces. And if you take nothing else out of this talk, I think this is so, so interesting because the implications for society and the distribution of wealth certainly makes you think. That first factor is virtuous cycles. So there are these things called data network effects and feedback loops. And let me give you an example of how it works. When you go to Google and you search for something, uh, let's say cute puppies, and you might have to scroll down and go to the second page to find the results you're looking for. And so you click on that result. Now, by doing that, you have given Google some good information. You've told Google that the best result is the one that you clicked. Now, when you multiply that over many, many people, they start to understand how they can match search queries with results. And they change their uh, search algorithm accordingly. So that means that maybe that search result on the third page or the second page that you found will then go up to the top of the results list. So this means that over time, not only are, um, is Google able to collect more information in this case, but they're able to improve their algorithms. And as they improve their algorithms, of course, you're probably more likely to want to keep using their uh, service and then you'll tell other people to use it as well. And then in turn, they create more data and so on and so forth. And that explains why in 2009, um, Bing went to try and get into the search game and just hasn't been able to get a foothold because Google got in there first and had this virtuous cycle. So this is what the cycle looks like. More data, better algorithms, it allows you to create better services and products. And that gets more usage and more customers. And the cycle goes on and on and on. If you put that over a longer time period, it really presents an interesting picture of what it means for um, companies and organizations that are able to move first. I think we cannot wait to implement AI that we need to start getting into the game and uh, letting these virtuous cycles uh, help us along the way. Now, the second and final uh, point that I want to highlight here for why you should think strategically about AI and what the implications are for being a laggard is uh, the possibility to be disrupted in your industry. And um, in the world of AI, this is called collision. And 
it's this notion that when you're working with a digital or AI based operating model, the rules of the game are different for you. So let's take a step back for a second and think about the rules of traditional business. So if you have a hotel chain and you want to have more customers, what do you have to do? You have to go and create another hotel, perhaps, you know, another location, a bigger building, you need to hire more staff. And so as you get more users or more customers, it costs you money, right? And this can even happen in online businesses as well, um, to some extent. But when you're making your company fully AI powered and digitized, you don't have these constraints anymore. You can scale without these um, costs that you have to incur. And so for um, AI and digital operating business models, there is increasing returns to scale and these returns are very hard to beat. So going back to the hotel example before, let's think about what it costs Airbnb to add another user to its platform. It doesn't cost a huge amount. And that what do they need to do to add another user, perhaps expand their um, cloud storage space, perhaps eventually they'll need another um, data engineer, but they can produce value very, very easily. So this means that there is a huge um, impetus for us to both get started and get started soon. And as we think about this competitive landscape, a really important question that I would like to ask is, what would you prefer to be? Would you prefer to be stuck and to think about doing what you've always done? Or are you open to changing your mindset about how you do business and not think about how you deliver value, but about the value that you're trying to deliver? See, if we change our mentality when it comes to strategy and start thinking about the needs that we're trying to meet, how we meet those needs becomes irrelevant. And this is where the age old saying of, do you want to be Netflix or do you want to be Blockbuster comes into account. At the moment we start changing the um, orientation in our mind about how, about serving a need as opposed to how we do it, then we open ourselves to these possibilities of taking on a different operating model about using AI to solve problems and, and being transformative um, in this modern age. So where should we start if we want to do this? But this is what I'm going to talk about now. And a great place to start with all things is with a small step. Um, I would start with an initial AI project. And I would want to see that project having three key components. And the first one is it should be impactful to your strategy. When companies get all excited about AI, there is this tendency to create um, AI products where they might not be needed. But one thing, particularly as a strategist, that comes to my mind is to always treat AI as a tool that should be serving those business priorities, not the other way around. So business priorities should match AI priorities. They're not two different things. And they should be driven by those priorities. So select uh, projects for those initial projects that have real value for the executive directors of the company and um, the company as a whole in, in terms of where it wants to go. The second question, particularly for initial projects, is its feasibility. What data do you already have access to? What technology components do you have that you can leverage? I think a very good way to start here is by targeting what you'd call easy wins. And this allows your organization to build confidence as you're experimenting with this and to gain trust in, in what you're doing and what AI can, can do for the company. So if we look at this two by two matrix, and this is how you know someone's an acad academic when they can't do anything without <laughs> presenting a, a matrix like this, uh, then you it becomes kind of obvious what you should focus on. You want those high impact and low effort uh, projects initially, these obvious choices. And once you go um, 
through this journey a bit more, you want to diversify and create a portfolio approach. So those might be these more strategic choices and tactical choices. Some of the most transformational AI projects are not going to be easy and they are going to take a lot of investment, but we certainly don't need to tackle those initially. I told you that there'll be three components that I think we should focus on when doing these initial AI projects. So here's the third one, which is not often uh, noted when we talk about AI, and, and that is its measurability. I would suggest that when we start with AI projects, we select things that are very measurable and that those measurements have real meaning to both managers and employees. Because if you want to understand if it's working and why people should care, then you need to know what you're measuring. And you should determine that beforehand because <laughs> otherwise you get lost along the way. The second suggestion I have for when beginning with AI is to set up the project for success by doing two things. The first one is by understanding that AI projects are not things that are done by a data science team or an AI team or a digital team. It needs collaboration. And this is so, so important. And there are some um, uh, articles noted down below there that I would encourage you to read if you're interested in this. But collaboration is absolutely fundamental. And studies that show why AI projects have failed is because they have left the projects to an isolated group of data scientists who might not actually know what they're measuring. They're really, really good at optimizing and they can create incredible algorithms, but is what they're optimizing for really relevant? So a lot of suggestions um, highlight the need to pair up your technical teams with your subject matter experts and to work closely together to define what those measurable outcomes will be and what you should focus on along the way. Uh, initial uh, projects would probably benefit from having a talent hub of data scientists. And these individuals work together to share knowledge and to gain competencies. And then they go out and um, work with uh, different business units, to different business functions or geographies. Now, as the business scales and gets bigger, then you can think about decentralizing your AI and data talent team. So therefore you have AI people in all different parts of your organization. And the second part that factor that sets the company up for success with these AI projects is by incentivizing AI goals. Again, research that looks at um, AI failures indicates that AI fails when we view the outcomes as just something that's isolated to data scientists again. It's not just about the subject matter experts or the technical people who need to make AI work. It's the people who use it. If you have a recommendation system for those IBM managers that I mentioned before that need to nudge, that get a nudge about their employees and that they might you know, be wanting to, 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 to leave the organization because they haven't been recognized for certain things, then it's the manager's responsibility to actually take those recommendations and implement them as the end user. And that's not hard to do. Who wants to be told from an AI bot what it should do? So one thing that um, is suggested in the literature is to actually incentivize AI outcomes. So let's say you want to reduce turnover well, maybe the, the technical people, the, the subject matter expertise and the managers all get an, a financial incentive for doing that. And so they're all in it together. They've all got the same goals. And they should also be rewarded for doing it, um, for giving feedback along the way. Because when they are able to say, hey, that feedback wasn't relevant or here's the outcome of my conversation with the employee, you're able to continuously improve and engage in that virtuous cycle that we talked about before. And this leads us to the last suggestion. And I think this is an important one as we think about our context here in New Zealand, which is to reskill our talent. Now, when uh, business managers were asked about the issues that they faced when trying to implement AI, 30% of them noted that the difficulties and delays in recruiting talent 
was an issue for them. What a thought. 30%, that is, that's problematic. And yet when you look into the data and you find out uh, what people are doing about it, the answer is very little. Only 27% of firms plan to upskill their own workers. Now, this is, this is concerning for a couple of reasons. First one is that it's not sustainable over the long term. And the second is that AI is advancing so rapidly. You know, it has this community where algorithms are constantly um, improved and implemented. So we need to keep upskilling people on AI. It's not a discrete um, occurrence that happens once. What Google did um, when they decided to be an AI first company was to create an internal training program. They had employees spend six months working in a machine learning team and they were assigned a mentor. Now, at the end of that six month period, those AI experts, they were now AI experts after six months, um, I should note as well, they were engineers, so they already had um, you know, good data skills. It was just about getting into the mindset of machine learning and understanding those tools. So once they were experts, they were then distributed throughout the organization, throughout all of the different product teams, and therefore Google was able to change the way it functioned. Now, this might not be realistic for a lot of our organizations, but I love the focus on training and upskilling talent. And on my last slide for this talk, I want to highlight the fact that it's not something that is only limited to technical staff members. Reskilling for AI is a problem that we should all consider. It's something that I think managers need to invest in a lot more. I see right now a huge gap between an understanding of AI in our environment. You have people who are technical and you have managers and there is very little um, conversation between those two extremes. I love this quote by Ian City and Lakhani, which says, managers do not need to become data scientists, statisticians, programmers, or AI engineers. Rather, just as every MBA student learns about accounting and its salience to business operations without wanting to become a professional accountant, managers need to do the same with AI and related technology. I think we all have an impetus to educate ourselves on AI, and it's never been easier to do so. One of my favorite things about the AI community is its culture of open source. I mentioned that there are these open source algorithms and there is a huge community that invests in improving the algorithms and sharing them with each other. And that same openness exists in education as well. There are massive open online courses such as Coursera that are coming up to help educate managers on the more technical aspect, uh, aspects. And there's certainly a gap here to um, train in-house um, individuals as well. So I hope that this talk has helped you understand what AI is, the three ways that it can help your organizations today, which include automating work, augmenting decision-making, and um, also engaging with customers and employees. I've highlighted the fact that businesses in New Zealand are starting to invest in AI. And these investments were quite significant in the 20, 20 to 21 financial year. And we're very likely to see an increase in this. And those firms that have invested are already reaping the benefits. I've also highlighted two big issues about being slow to implement AI. I've highlighted that you can be at a competitive disadvantage if you wait too long because there are these virtuous cycles that companies engage in when they collect more data, improve algorithms, attract users, and the loop goes on. And that when organizations adapt these different business models, their ability to create value increases over time. Finally, I talked about where we should begin with AI. And some of those points include starting an easy win project, a project that's aligned with the priorities and the strategic vision of an organization, and that is feasible and measurable. I also highlighted that we want to incentivize people to um, 
engage with AI at all levels, not just a technical team, not just the subject matter, matter expertise, but all experts, but also those end users who actually have to use it. And I've talked about um, the fact that getting started with a digital team could be something that you uh, create a hub for, where you have data scientists and AI experts in a small hub that then get distributed to different projects or different geographical locations or products until the company starts to uh, build competence and uh, learn more about it and trust AI more. And at that point, it makes sense to start um, locating your AI and data team um, within different functions of the business. So I hope that has been helpful. I would love to hear any thoughts or questions you have. And if you want to reach out to me, on any social media channel, you can reach me um, at uh, Amanda on Data, both LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, whatever it may be. Um, you can reach me on that or email, um, which you'll find on the web. So um, that is my talk today. If there are, I think we have time actually for one or two I know, questions. So, uh, thank you, Amanda. I was going to say you've done such a good job of um, putting in a lot of information in a short amount of time, very pithy, uh, that I'm going to give the participants uh, on the call a chance to be thinking of questions um, because I'm going to um, be turning it over to Matt for some closing comments to help wrap it up. So if um, people on the call would like to start dropping questions into the chat, that would be the, the most effective way. Um, and Amanda, you can certainly scan them yourself and I can feed you some as well. This is the prerogative of the MC to change the format in, in as we go. Um, but no, it's great because I, I, I know that people will have questions. So um, I'm gonna ask our pro vice chancellor at uh, Wakato Management School, Matt Bulger, to um, have some closing comments, which might help spur some thinking for some questions. So over to you, Matt. Kia ora, Eva, and I was actually just working on my question, uh, but I can <laughs> make my make my remarks and then uh, then I'll open up the questions anyway. Um, Amanda, thank you so much. That was really interesting uh, as I suspected it would be. Um, so there, there are a couple of um, lenses or thoughts in my mind. The first is just on the topic. I uh, love the analogy you made right at the start about you know, electricity and trying to imagine a, 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 the scale of transformation. It's useful to have analogies like that in mind and that this is something that is already around us. It's, uh, it's happening in the interface we're using right at the moment. It's happening in our vehicles, in our daily emails, and the phones we're using. This is um, transformative technology to be used for ill or good. Um, and our task, of course, is to you know, drive people to use it um, better. It's, it's, a, it's a technology at a moral base, so we need to drive it the right ways. Um, so brilliant, um, brilliant exploration of the topic but also more generally, um, thank you, because this is in, in recognition of uh, your award and, and your honor. Just thank you for the work that you've done and for uh, the excellent uh, way that you're combining research, leadership, uh, and I mean that in the, in the hard research side, leadership of, and, and examples and connecting other, other early career researchers, connections with practice, connections across disciplines, all of the things uh, that you do. We really appreciate them. I know, of course, and, and some on this call will know that you're going to be spending quite a lot of time with uh, Deloitte and really in connecting research with practice very soon. But um, so we'll be seeing a little bit less of you, but we still will be seeing you uh, here at WMS, Te Papa. So again, congratulations on the, uh, on the award and on the talk. Really enjoyed it. And um, I'll now let some other people ask questions while I finish typing my own into the chat um, and open it up and I might we can wrap up in a few minutes. Eva. Great. Thank you, Matt. I appreciate that. Um, Amanda, can we start with Darren's question first? Because uh, I feel like that uh, there's a real urgency to that question. So Darren asked, uh, can Wakato businesses connect with the uni? 
uh, about experts to collaborate in this space? What are the opportunities? It's a great question. And it's one that I'm not entirely sure how to answer. It's definitely an evolving area where we've got a lot of um, investments um, in the AI space. For example, there is the AI Institute and that team are doing incredible things, primarily focused on um, fundamental research on algorithms. They're part of that community that push um, New Zealand forward as being AI leaders. They were actually one of the first um, groups in the world to produce software that other people would use to do a, to engage in AI. So this is something we should talk about, Darren. Great question. Thank you. Yeah, so Professor um, Albert Buffet is on this call. He's the director of the AI Institute, um, and there's certainly opportunities um, and always um, happy to help uh, as Associate Dean of Research uh, to connect with people up with the researchers. So um, yeah, I think there's, Darren, you're right, there's some, some great um, suggestions and opportunities. It wouldn't be an academic uh, presentation if we didn't take a critical lens. So Debashish um, has given us a really good, uh, a, a couple of questions. Amanda, can you see Debashish's questions and you could take all of it or part of it. I'm gonna leave it over to you. Absolutely. So Debashish is asking about bias in AI. And this is a very, very important topic. So as I highlighted all of these areas where you can use AI, you'll notice that the key point there is about giving this data giving inputs to your algorithm. Now, inputs are based on past data and your organization might not uh, want to make the same decisions it's made in the past. So let's talk about hiring decisions. So there are really impressive algorithms that can help identify which individuals will perform best. Now, we know that um, companies were not always very good with their hiring decisions, that there was a lot of bias um, in those decisions, and it's quite antiquated. Now, we're using that data often to make decisions in the future. So there are, there's bias in our data already. And AI doesn't know what it's selecting on. It's just learning from the data and then providing suggestions. So considering um, what those biases are and how your data might be influenced and also trying to counteract them is really important. And I think a really important um, strategy for doing that is uh, considering if you know why decisions are made. This is understandable AI. For example, if you're making a loan decision, instead of using a black box algorithm, use an algorithm which can tell you what decisions it's made, like a decision tree. And then you can understand why certain individuals were not given the loan or not suggested to give the loan and you can work backwards from there. So I think it is a very big issue and definitely something that should be considered along with security issues um, when we move to centralizing data and uh, working with these algorithms. Great question. Thank you, Amanda. So Clayton is interested, you, you talked a little bit about um, the competitive space amongst businesses, but what about New Zealand's competitive space internationally? How do we compare? Um, he had a particular interest in how do we compare with Australia um, and what are the implications if we're a laggard? Because I think you did say that we were a little bit slow on the uptake, but can you address that question, please? The data that I've looked at in this space, Clayton, suggests that we are a bit slower. Um, and I think a key reason for that might be because our key um, organizations are in the primary industries. And where this is the area where it's been a little bit harder to make AI work. You know, we talked about um, what you can't do with AI yet. And you know, kiwi fruit uh, picking is one of those areas where we're just not there yet. I mean, even at um, the university, uh, there is a great team with Nick Pickering who is making great progress in this area, but we're not there. So I think that might, might be one reason we're a bit slower, but I cannot quantify it exactly because um, I'm, what I'm doing is just looking at different adoptions uh, levels and noted, noting that New Zealand's a bit lower than Australia, but it's not a direct comparison. So I'm not able to say um, completely with complete um, assurance there, Clayton. Thank you. Um, I'm going to combine a couple of questions because um, Matt's question 
and Alicia, I'm not sure if I said your name right, sorry, uh, has have um, a similar question and it's about that difference uh, about small business, large business uptake. Um, Matt was wondering uh, about um, the advantage for larger companies given the cost of getting started. Um, but the other question is about um, how small businesses practically can gather the data um, required. So there is, I could see, especially we're such a country of small businesses. Mm -hmm. Can you speak to that different profile of large business adoption of AI compared to a small business? That's a great question. I think that when it comes to data, um, AI favors the rich in the sense that organizations that have data are at an advantage at the beginning. Um, but some studies indicate that it doesn't mean that small businesses can't compete. They provide a suggestion to focus on a niche. So you're not trying to compete on search. You try and make one very, very small and niche um, product or service better. But yeah, it's, it's a great question. If we know about these virtuous cycles, then what are the implications? And also the cost of having a team, I think, is, as Matt puts out there, it's expensive. You need a AI and data team. How do you get that? I think as we uh, are now moving into this low code or no code era, that these barriers to AI entry are lowering. So hopefully we'll see more small businesses moving into that niche and capitalizing on the very small niche topics that they can, but definitely not going against those um, large incumbent tech firms. So there's a, another question from Roya Amanda about um, some of the negative side of AI uh, and um, particularly about um, low skilled labor and is it going to lead to higher unemployment? That's certainly a concern that I've heard. So is that what you're seeing? Is it going to um, end up uh, again, especially for the low skilled labor, is it going to be mean less jobs? That's a great area um, of debate at the moment. So my personal opinion, um, based on what I've read, is that we have labour shortages in low school jobs. In New Zealand, for example, we have huge issues. We have fruit dying on the vine. There are jobs that we just, that people just don't want to do. So I see the implications for AI to be not very harmful here um, initially because it's really doing those repetitive jobs, the jobs that people actually don't really enjoy doing. But as it improves and um, is able to do more sophisticated things, then I think we certainly could run into issues. And I'm gonna take the prerogative of the chair one more time. So uh, Albert and I are co-supervising a master's student who's on the call as well. And she's looking at New Zealand companies um, use of AI rela related to environmental strategy. And it's been, uh, it hasn't been easy to find companies who are using it. And I saw, heard your energy example. Are you seeing a lot of companies seeing this as a way to solve climate change, their, their carbon profile issues and things like that? Um, well, N Nelson AI has produced a really interesting product, which is called Carbon Crop, that allows um, farmers to look at their land and identify what types of trees that they have on that land to understand uh, what their carbon offset might be. And that's just one small and very powerful startup that's doing that. But the bigger question is, are we seeing wider implementation of AI um, tools to uh, combat issues around the environment. And there is some movement, but it's not mainstream yet. It's really these you know, small startups doing really amazing things that I think we should definitely watch. It's an evolving space. So last, last question, I'm gonna combine again, uh, Cecile and Daniel, and it's about bringing it back home, right? So you're um, about to change roles and you've been in this AI space and it's think of it like an exit interview. How can the <laughs> university um, take up AI and, and from a strategic perspective and, and do more with it? Which do you have thoughts on that? That's a wonderful question. And my good friend, uh, Professor Albert Buffett, um, has some really amazing insights on this. And so I'm going to borrow some of them here. I hope you don't mind, Albert. Um, and 
they are, for example, better understanding our um, students is number one. We have data and silos all across our organization, much like all organizations do. We've got these legacy systems and it's very hard to access information about students, right? And if we can bring this information together and help understand how uh, students are engaging on their online platform, tailor the, our responses to them based on those engagements and even send students updates like, hey, I noticed you haven't uh, logged into our online learning platform for a while. Perhaps you need this or that. I think we can definitely be more responsive, bring the data together and um, help personalize our teaching as well. But definitely understanding our students would be would be really useful, as it would in, in all organizations. And I'm, I think for a more detailed um, outline of this, please do chat with um, Professor Buffett, who has written um, extensively on this topic. Thank you, Amanda. And I also uh, got a little nudge in the comments about that um, the um, University Management School is looking at providing short courses um, and maybe we could have Amanda back uh, with Albert um, to deliver some of the, that content. So look for those future opportunities, little sales pitch at the end, sorry. Um, so I did want to, for those of you who weren't able to ask a question or an hour from now, you think of, of a really urgent question. If you're going old school, you can use amanda.williamson at wakato.ac.nz. So uh, email her um, and she's happy to, to engage and answer questions. We'd like to close with a karakia. So John, can I go back to you please to close us out? E mihi ana ki a koutou i ngā ahutanga o te rā, ngā piki me ngā heke, ki a tō iho ngā manakitanga o te runga rāwa ki runga i a koutou, pai māri e, e karakia a mutunga. Unuhia, unuhia, unuhia ki te uru tapu nui, ki a wātea, ki a māma te nāko te tinana, a te wairua i te aratakata. Ko ia rā e rongo whakairia ake ki runga ki a tīna, tīna, huie, taikie. Thank you, John. And um, thank you, Amanda, for all of your work. It's been great to, to hear all, all of the knowledge that you have in this area. Um, we're excited for our future relationship with you, uh, albeit a little bit changed um, and thank you to all the participants for making time um, to come and, and um, share. So have a good day, everybody. Thank you.